What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Talking Dogs podcast. This is going to be episode nine. Um, today, man, I had a pretty good day, uh, and I just want to thank each and every one of you guys for that because, uh, you know, it is all because of you guys. Um, I finally went ahead and got approved for the monetization on the channel. Um, as of right now, I can only do the the thanks. Um, so there's going to be a new thanks tab down at the bottom of the videos. You guys get in there, and if you guys want to thank me for my time or thank me for my help that I've helped anybody with, you know, feel free to do that. Um, by no means, don't feel obligated to do it, but you know, it would really be awesome. Enough of that. Let's go ahead and talk about some dog stuff, you guys. So today I had kind of a, a nostalgic moment, a kind of look back moment. Um, I actually, as you guys know, I'm, I'm going to be going on vacation. Uh, so the next two weeks, I'm probably about more like the next week and a half. There won't be any videos up. So this will be probably the last video that I do uh, until I get back from vacation. So you guys just bear with me. I'll have content coming out. But um, I have uh, had like a nostalgic moment today. I actually went down to drop off uh, a couple of the dogs to... Um, Jim Wales down there at JW Kennels um, to get boarded and while I was down there you know I went and I checked out the dogs I seen you know his blue ticks that he's got down there which cash man you know came out of them dogs down there and seeing them dogs man it really just kind of struck a, a little moment in me and I was like man I tell you what if I would have been in a better off position uh, I would have hanged on to that cash man dog, but all in all, I'm happy with where he went. He's better off being hunted over there. Um, I've known Corey for, you know, 15 years. We hunted a lot. So Corey, if you listen to these, you know, I hope you're doing well over there. I know I talked to you here and there about cash man and, uh, he's doing well. So a little update on cash man. And last time I talked to Corey, uh, he said he, he, Corey had him. I gave him about halfway through season gave him to him he said he knocked down about 50 or 60 coons to him so you know hopefully this season coming up cashman will be going real real strong and uh, i'll be able to get out there and get in the woods with him a couple times here or there um i've kind of refrained from doing that because you know there it was nothing to do with the dog at all it was all me it was all me not having enough time to hunt him and feeling just so awful about not getting him in the woods and stuff that's why I ultimately offered him up to Corey. Um, but Corey's offered me to come hunt him anytime, and I may take him up on that offer. But so there's that little bit of a nostalgic moment, and I just want to talk a little bit about these nostalgic moments that we get when we when we get these dogs that, you know, show us everything that we want to see, that do really well. Some of these dogs cause us to have these nostalgic moments because it's kind of like a first accomplishment with a lot of these dogs especially when we're younger and we get a hold of these dogs and messing around and we might not know exactly what we're doing all the way but we still the dog still you know goes out and performs the dog still goes out and learns uh, and that's one thing about hazard i've talked about hazard on the channel before all the issues he had i mean he was plying bank scared to death of a coon um but he would still tree him and the only thing i could cook that up to the only thing i could boil that down to is that that dog would flat up tree a coon just because he liked me he didn't want no piece of a coon he was scared of him but he plain blank would go and tree him anyway just because i wanted him to and that's that's a lot of dedication that's a lot of camaraderie between me and that dog and i think that's kind of you know a good place that's a good place to thrive when we're out here and that's a good place to you know try to get to with a dog a dog that will lay it on the line for you a dog that will overcome issues for you and you know be on the same page with you and don't get me wrong uh hazard put me through the ringer and i mean he put me through the ringer big time um, but all in all, it, it's kind of like that thing, you know, 
you have a dog that has all these problems, but he'll still go out there and do that job because you asked him to. So have a dog that'll lay it all out there for you and, you know, help you along and give you breaks here and there. That's a good dog. That's a dog that you want to look for. And I kind of want to just say, this are the, these are what's going to be what we're looking for is when we're training on a dog, a dog that will lob you some easy, some easy passes, a dog that'll cut you a break uh, and in a position to where you're pretty much just holding your fingers crossed that he'll put it together. Right. So there, there's lots of instances of this. Um, when we're going through different trainings, uh, you know, we can hope that the dog will put it together on its own. The dog may show you and show you and show you that it's not going to put it together. And then all of a sudden it just puts it together and you go, thank goodness I didn't have to teach him that because it's so hard to even, uh, you know, concoct any type of idea to even teach a dog to do certain stuff. And I think that's a big reason why um, coonhound training and training coon dogs to hunt is such a hard thing because there is... You know, it's 50% us, 50% the dog, you know, when we're in the training. They have to have it. They have to have some degree of know-how, some degree of problem solving to put things together. And they have to have an ultimate want to please, right? Because if the dog don't want to please you, the dog doesn't want to be your friend, the dog doesn't want to be on your good side always, um, what's going to happen is that dog is going to quit trying, right? We have to have a dog that will try. Okay, so if we can get a dog to the tree and maybe it don't bark and then you're kind of like, man, that's I'm not real too happy about that and, you know, get down about it. The dog will see that and it goes back out there and does something a little bit different and does something a little bit different and it does something a little bit different. And then, then finally the dog will figure out what you're looking for, you know. So it's kind of like a two-way street like that. And I think the quicker and the faster that we can build this kind of – this kind of communication with our own hound uh, in our own way, the more that they know us and the more we know them, the lot easier it is going to be for them to go ahead and throw you that softball, to throw you that break in the training. And a lot of guys get stuck here. You know, I've been stuck, and you just get stuck, and it's just like ever-ending, never-ending in this stuck thing like he just is stuck in this one spot and he just will not go forward and we have to try this and we have to try that and we try it this way and we try it that way and we put them up and we bring them back out and we try it again these are definitely the trying times and and you know having a big bag of tricks having a lot of understandings and ultimately not losing faith in the dog that the dog is going to get it and get it figured out uh, is definitely where you kind of want to stay at in your headspace. Um, like I said on the channel before, you know, Cash Man, going back to that, uh, Cash Man was me proving something, and I'll just say that flat out, that Cash Man was me proving something. Um, you know, growing up, having dogs and going through dogs you know had a lot of a lot of opposing views had a, a lot of information that was cross-wired and I had a lot of good information but I also got a lot of bad information and I also had a lot of people who thought it was okay for them to meddle and you know meddle with my dogs and fool with my dogs when I weren't around and and do things like that and ultimately it just makes for the worst hardest time to get a dog going if you got you know seven hands you know training on them constantly it's impossible for a dog to even figure out which one of you he's gonna have they're gonna have to listen to and I know that some of this stuff was don't, done with me knowing about it, and some of the stuff was done without me knowing about it. Uh, I, and it was just like over and over again, it was, uh, I felt like when I was training my first few dogs there, fighting against everything, that, you know, ultimately I'm a, I'm a bound and determined individual. So there was nothing going to stop me from training 
my dog right and i don't care if i had to break it 1700 ways from sunday from something else that somebody else taught it i was going to break that dog off of what they wanted it doing or what they fooled with it and thought they fixed in it i'm going to fix that dog right back to how i want it and i'm going to push on did it take me a heck of a lot longer absolutely did ultimately time run out on a couple dogs and they got shipped off yeah you know and that's kind of what the sad fact about it is if you got everybody fooling with your dog uh, ultimately the dog just suffers at the end of it because i know i had a couple dogs that would definitely been a hundred light years ahead if people would have just laid off and mind their own business and you know kept their hands off my dogs when i weren't around and stuff like that and you know it, it just all boils down to you know this hard-headedness to where everybody thinks they know what's best for a dog or everybody thinks they know the best way to do it and that's all fine and good uh, you can have your way i'll have my way but all in all at the end of the day if we're not on a level of understanding with one another that i know the way that you want to do it i know the way that you want to train your dog I'll put myself in your shoes. I'll look at that dog through the glasses that you're looking at that dog through. I will help you remedy and solve issues for your dog the way that you want them solved instead of jerking a dog out of place, jerking a dog, you know, off track and and getting them sidetracked onto some other stuff and it just creates more problems at the end of the day. And I and I think all in all, Cashman was my I'm going to prove it to you all. And he was my I'm going to prove it to you all dog because my first coonhound I ever got was a female named Dixie. And my brother just flat out gave me the dog. He had traded a shotgun for two puppies. The puppy showed up and I thought Dixie was probably plain blank one of the, you know, better looking blue ticks that i had ever come across and i liked that dog a lot i you know, just looking at it and i just i just stared that dog down and watch it and i was like man i really like that pup that's a really nice pup you know suited me well uh, it was my brother's but you know on him he, he did me a good solid and he just forked it over and said here you can have it and i took that dog and Dude, I, I put so much work and so much effort and so much time into handling on that dog because at that point in time, I had had a Rottweiler and her whole thing being a Rottweiler was I needed to have the obedience training. I needed to have leash training. I needed to have, you know, just mounds and mounds and mounds of time onto that dog just because of the fact that she was a rot and you know they need a lot of this stuff and i didn't want to have a rottweiler that got out of hand even as a young kid now you know i was only probably about 17 um when i got her and i spent endless countless amounts of hours and years training that dog and i got a hold of that blue tick puppy and i tried to do it the same way right so i tried to really crack down on the obedience factor for the dog and and ultimately that's what i got you know i i really got a really really sweet handling little female blue tick uh collar out of the woods didn't have no shot collars on her never had gps on her cut her in the woods i can call her straight back and she'd be right there and boy, let me tell you something, it took me a lot of frustrations, it took me a lot of hard times, it took me running 40 miles an hour through the woods after a dog to get it caught and teach it its lesson, to get that dog to recall without having no shock system, without having anything else on that dog, um, but I did it. And I flat up broke her, and she'd call right out of the woods. Only the only coon dog we had at that time that would call out of the woods. Um, and she did good, you know. 
she's super slow starting like i said you know at some point in time somebody threw some squirrels to her is cutting her off the leash when i was gone and trying to hunt her and take her in the woods and trying to cut her behind other dogs when i weren't there and it, it was just a headache it was such a fight to try to keep that dog trained or keep an even a judge on that dog that i could know where i left that dog is where i wanted it and come back and it's been and it's different you know one point in time uh had her going in the woods had the woods time on her and then you know for whatever reason she was chained up out by the garage there and somebody left the floodlight on and left it on and kept leaving it on every night every night that floodlight got left on for you know a couple weeks here a couple weeks there and what that turned into is that just made her a light dog so then i took her in the woods and she won't go outside of my light and i'm going well what the hey because i had her out last time and she was going she's off by herself she wasn't scared of the dark now she's scared of the dark and it took me a month it took me a solid month of figuring on that dog why she would not go in the woods outside my light and if i turned my light off she tried to hug my leg plan blink got scared of the dark and then it dawned on me she's been sitting out there in the light for a month or more now she's definitely you know she done definitely got sweetened up and don't want to go in the dark because she knows she's got light somewhere so that was another big headache to fix and this is where i kind of grasped a hold of this idea of you know light dogs are a thing and uh got her up to the point you know we knock coons down off to the other dogs and throw them in the freezer and get them froze and we get out and fool around and try to train on one and i took a frozen coon out we had that bow dog my brother had a you know male blue tick named Bo. that thing he would not treat nothing but a whopper i i don't know what it was every coon that dog treed was just the biggest it was bigger every time i felt like and uh so we'd throw them things in the freezer and get them trained on and train on pups with them and stuff so it was time to start running drags for that old dixie dog and i ran some drags for her and uh put it up in a tree she went right out there looking good looking like she's fixing the tree up good and lo and behold that frozen coon fell out of the tree and whopped her right on the head about knocked her out and she would not bark after that i could not get that dog to bark on a tree couldn't get that dog to even look up a tree for i mean six or eight months almost to a year um so after that happened it was kind of complete training on her um, because she had just had a bad taste put in her mouth real real bad i mean uh you know 20 25 pound frozen coon just cracked you on the head as a pup uh, that'll do something to you so that got a funny rap put in her brain and uh and on top of that i did not allow her to bark while she's out in the yard and stuff because i just he just didn't do it you know he doesn't allow him to sit and bark on the yard and she would she's one of them dogs that <clears throat> so they'd bark after you all the time so and that had a lot to do with putting so much obedience training on her and spending so much one on time one on one time with her it kind of turned her into this people dog and that's kind of what i talk about when i say we don't want these people smart dogs we kind of need them you know less keen on people and more keen on hunting and if we spend too much time with them we work with them too much we put too much obedience training on them they'll get real used to and real attached to you and it'd be real hard to to get them to peel away from you it makes it two two three four times harder to get one to go if they're attached to your hip so bad <clears throat> we can build a camaraderie and build a bond and not have to be so you know reliant on each other right so the dog need to be so reliant on us and getting approval for every fart that's let you know we can't be that way especially with the hunting dog one that needs to be out there be so low be in the woods by itself so you know i made quite a lot of mistakes and other people made mistakes for me and ultimately what i end up doing with that dog is shove her in the woods with the older dogs and they just put her in the woods 
put her in the woods, put her in the woods, put her in, I mean, I put that dog in the woods with another dog forever. And she would not tree up, would not tree up. It was months and months and months before she'd even run track with another dog. But she wouldn't dare get on a tree still after that incident with the coon. And, you know, about that time is when I got a hold of that hazard dog. And I had her kind of as a side deal. And she was doing all the messing up that she could possibly do by that point. And I got a hold of that hazard dog. And he just showed me about 400 times more than uh, in his shape that he was in he showed me about 400 times more than uh that dixie dog did and finally you know we get out there and we run run one night and i'm s sitting there looking flat at a coon in a tree my brother shined it and sitting in the fork of a tree um his male dog had already blew past it and went out and was running down another one um, that little Dixie dog got up on that tree and just let her out her one little baby bark. Uh, it was like the quietest things you'd ever seen. And right at that time, my brother just went, hey, hollering for me. And I was watching that dog in that light. As soon as he said, hey, she just got scared and jumped off the tree. And that was, that was a wrap. Never ever after that did i ever see that dog get back on a tree and ain't nothing wrong with the part of my brother it, he wasn't trying to do nothing he was just trying to get my attention to look at the dog but it, again you know we are wrong something saying something wrong at the wrong time not letting a dog work or you know it, some dogs are super sensitive and that they'll be super sensitive to the surroundings and their the sounds and things and just so happened to be, it was just like a, it was just like a crazy thing, you know, one of them things that happened, one in a million chance that he, he went to holler for me, and it ended up scaring a dog, and I don't blame him none for that, but you know, it was just kind of like that was the last sucker punch that I got, and at that time, I had her going for you know. I didn't have her going. We had her for almost two years at that point, and not a single coon trapped. Could not trap a coon. I mean, we hunted our property out of coons. It, it, we'd wait. A, it'd be a month. We'd run them dogs in the woods every single night for a month, and finally they'd turn up one, and you'd go, "Well, ain't gonna be no more for another four or five months because we done shot everything in these woods." and everything in the woods next to it and next to it i mean we burnt them woods down man and and it was so hard could not trap a single thing because we done got them all and uh so two years without having no cage training two years of only seeing a dead coon and getting bonked on the head two years of just trying to start running track and almost treeing a coon on her own right in front of her face and just circumstances cause it not to happen got that walker dog he's sitting out there looking good outside of all his behavior issues that i knew i could work out of him as long as he would put in the work on the other end i'd keep working on him and he did and uh so then my cousin gave me the copper dog which was another blanket back dog i've talked about on the podcast um, i don't think i put his name out there but copper was that dog's name and when i when i got that dog I decided, well, I'm all in on these walker dogs. So I gave my brother the papers back to that little female and let him have her. And just the craziest thing ended up happening like a day or two after that. We're cruising down the road season. It's about uh, January and we had a big cold spell come in for a couple weeks and i mean it was a cold spell and we were running down the road to the store and right along the side of the road there's a coon walking down the side of the road we jumped out we threw a blanket on that thing put it in a dang trunk took it home put it in a live trap and fed it and watered it real good and 
watched it for a while, make sure it was drinking so I didn't have rabies. So it wasn't a rabid coon. It was just about starved. Everything was so cold. And uh, we fed it. It got got its life back, started getting real mean, started getting real aggressive, you know, like they do. So went out there, put them dogs on that tree, or put them dogs on that coon. And Dixie was there at that time. She wasn't mine anymore. She was my brother's, so. I uh, sat there and watched her work her first cage and seeing her running up down the trees and you now getting the work on her that we couldn't get on any dog at that point in time. Just luck of the Irish or luck of the draw, whatever you want to call it. We found that in Coon walking down the road and uh, put the work on that dog. It wasn't even two weeks later he sold that dog off. And I was just like, well, I'm in on these walker dogs for sure. Went out and bought me a pair of pups. Uh, talked about them, Duke and Daisy and Duke is what their name was, a male and a female. Paid 50 bucks for the pair. I've talked about them on the channel. And, uh, you know, at this point in time, I pretty much had used that cage to get some good training put in on uh, Hazard. And once I got the good training put in on Hazard, he was trained drags blind. He was trained surprise drags. This is where I really went through and worked out and nitty grittied up my process for my drags. Well, a lot of it, more than half of it, I would say, I worked out with that dog on that particular cage over the course of that little bit of time that we had that coon in that cage. Um, Copper, he was he would tree coons and he had tree possums. I mean, I think that he was training more possums at that time because my cousin, you know, got mad and started just shooting the possums to him and said, you know, well, I ain't gonna worry about it. You wanna tree the possums, we'll shoot the possums to you. So at that point in time he weren't training much but a possum. Um and he's eating his dad up on the tree, different things like that. So I had that dog yeah, I kind of back burnered him a lot because after I got him, my cousin told me about the possums. Uh, you know, he said I've knocked possums down to him. I don't think, uh, I think he'll still tree some coons and stuff, but he was treeing coons on his tree possums. I said, I ain't worried about it. We'll run him and see what he does. Ran him, he treated me a possum, and I just said, hmm. Well, I'm just going to back burner that problem for a long time. And this one right here, this is what you're going to find out there, little brother. So, um, Copper would treat a possum quicker than he'd treat a coon. And so I chained him up, and I was, I'll work on that later. I got this dog over here. He's doing good, looking good, working him out of all of his issues. He's starting to look better on the coons, and that drag training really set him off. So, or that cage training really set him off. And then about that time, we had, uh, you know, a couple months go by. We had the other two pups that I had there. So, I uh, went ahead and got the frozen coon out. And this is where I started implementing leash them back uh, right here. Because them dogs... They, you couldn't really get them to bark, but if you put them on a leash or put them on their tie out, they'd go to barking. So I had me the big bright idea. Well, I'll leash them back because that's the only time I can get them barking is if I leash them back because they're just pups. I mean, they are two and a half, three months old. They were just pup pups, and uh, all they want to do is follow you around and stuff like that. So I leashed them back. Went and got the frozen coon, come out there and teased him with a little bit, got him barking at it. And uh, that Duke puppy, I mean, he got to barking at that thing so intensely. I'm like, okay, he's ready. He's ready for a drag, ran him a drag. He treated the drag, took him out. And, uh, well, prior before that, I had uh, put a feeder out to try to get the uh, hazard going. So I had a feeder out in the woods. And I'd go cut on a feeder every night and, and see what he'd turn up. He eventually treated his first coon over there off that feeder. And I thought I had me a solid coon dog buddy after that. But anyways, uh, back to uh, Duke. You know, it wasn't. It was all within a few same little months here that all this was going on. So I had that feeder out there. Hazard to treat up his first coon for me. Uh 
Copper was treeing possums. Daisy and Duke were about two and a half, three months old. I had to feed her. Took Duke and cut him over to feed her in the daytime while I snuck him out there and watched. And there were some squirrels on the feeder. And I cut him out there, and I, I, he didn't bark or nothing. He didn't tree nothing. So I was like, well, I'll try to start him on squirrels. And I went out there, and I popped a, a squirrel and uh, got him worked on a tree with it. He treed up good with it. I, that dog had to hold of that squirrel so hard. I, like I said, I thought I had to break it out of his jaws with a breaking stick. He had that thing so tight, man, you know. And uh, so I get him and tie him all back and get these frozen coons out there. My little sister at that time, so Emily, if you watch my stuff, my little sister, she um, she helped me that day. Uh, she's probably only five, six, seven years old, something like that. She helped me get them dogs leashed back and handle them and cut them off and stuff. I mean, she did a really good job and appreciate that out of you there, sis. But uh, leashed that dog's back, got them barking real good, and... Ran a drag, come back, cut him off. Duke went and treed. My uh, older brother came over, and you know, day two around there, wanting to do some hunting. So I was like, well, we can go run this little puppy. You need some woods time on him and stuff. So we get out there and cut that little puppy. Of course, being me, I was, I, I don't know why in the world I thought I'd cut that pup instead of them old, older dogs, but me being me, I figured... This is what I'm doing right now. This is the dog I'm focusing on. I got four dang dogs. I need to focus on this one right now because this is what he's needing. So I was like, we'll take this three-month-old puppy and we'll see what he's going to do. Took him out, and uh, he treed up. I mean, we walked, and he's pretty close. He got off maybe you know, 20 yards, something like that, and he treed up. I mean, he treed up hard for being a three-month-old puppy. I look up in there, it's a squirrel nest, and I just shake my head. I'm like, okay, well, maybe he's got a squirrel up there. Shining around, shining around, didn't see nothing. And then we just ultimately put him back on a chain. And uh, about that time, my Rottweiler had gotten pregnant by my brother's dog. And uh, we had a litter of pups on the ground. or Yeah, I had a litter of pups on the ground. And she had about... 14 or 15 puppies she had a big litter of puppies so i'm going oh my goodness what i'm gonna do i got a rottweiler i got four coon hounds and i got 15 puppies i'm gonna have to do something i gotta shed some weight so i sell off uh daisy she she ran her drags and she tre treated her drags too i just didn't really care for her too much so i sold her off and I ended up selling that Duke duck puppy off because I was like, well, he's already treed up. I, I don't remember what I sold him for. I don't think it was very, very much because I felt I'd be uh, doing something bad. I bought him for so cheap, and I didn't want to rake people over the coals for him because I got him for so cheap. So, you know, there's that. I sold him. I ripped myself off on that dog is what I did. Um, and, you know, about that time, we moved, you know. I... I got rid of Daisy, I got rid of Duke, I had Copper and Hazard, I got rid of all them puppies, and I had my Rottweiler, and we moved from Michigan out to Wyoming, and I had to leave Copper and Hazard up here to the house, and uh, my uh, my cousin Booger went over there and he took care of them dogs while we were out in Wyoming. So we were out in Wyoming, I don't know, six or eight months or something like that before we come back down to the house to get all of our stuff and move the rest of our stuff. Come back down there, bought the papers for Hazard. Um, there were some goings on. Somebody had Pine Blank stole the papers to Copper and was causing problems. Uh, it was actually our landlady got in our house over there and went in there and went through our stuff and actually stole the papers from my dog. Started calling my cousin, you know, I uh, put the papers to the dog. And uh, little did she know, it's my cousin, and he gave me the dog, and his name are on the papers, and blah, 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 causing all this fuss and causing all this trouble. And I just thought, well, I ain't never going to get them papers back. I ain't This dog doesn't do nothing but tree possums anyway. Called my buddy up and said, I got this copper dog over here. You want him? You can have him. I'll drop him off. I went over there dropped him off. 
packed Hazard up, took him out to Wyoming. I was out in Wyoming for a good long time, and we ran that. I tried running him out there. I bought my first GPS while I was out there, and I tried running him. Out of, no luck. I mean, no luck at all. And uh, finally, I, I moved back to Michigan and brought my cousin with me to ride along their trip, you know, 20-hour drive or whatever it is. Got him to ride back to with me, and it was middle of winter, snow on the ground. It was season, and I thought, well, okay, well, I'm back here. I'm going to start running, running. I'm going to start getting you uh, hazard really solidified. And I ran every single night that I could get in the woods. I think the first couple of nights that we were out, I just cruised around this chunk of state land and cruised around and cruised around and cruised. I mean, I cruised for probably an hour, and I seen one cross the road, cut him behind it, uh, but he slammed it up a tree so hard. Well, first thing that he did is I he cut it, and he went, he backtracked it, so the coon went one way and he went the other, and he ran that thing 250, 300 yards back the other direction before he ever turned around and brought it back across the road which I didn't have no shocking system, only had the GPS. So he came, brought it back across the road, finally went over there, caught it on the ground and pushed it up a tree. We got it knocked down. And uh, that time, I mean, that one right there was the fire under him because I dropped that dog in the woods. He would put something up a tree. Um, he still had a little bit of issues leaving a tree. Every once in a while, he'd get kind of stuck running on the ground, wouldn't give me a tree. But, you know through a couple months of process and hunting him and keeping a hunt on him um you know had him going good and right there at the very end at that point in time i had moved in and uh with you know one of my exes and i moved in over there and her mom and dad just started in griping every day that dog's barking too much that dog's barking too much so so then I, they, without me knowing, again, here people fooling with my dang dogs all the time, without me knowing about it, went and got a shot collar and put the shot collar in a dog, and her dad ran that shot collar, and I didn't know it, and I think I had him laid up out there for maybe a week or two, something like that, and I go out there and he got a shot collar, and it's just blind blank buried right straight in his neck. Here I am, I'm about 17 years old, I got this grown man, shocking and zapping my dog to death without me knowing about it so i just grabbed that collar off that dog and i went upstairs and i threw it right on the table i said you ain't putting that collar back on my dog again and uh so right then and there i already knew it was going to be problems i can't have no dog out here so what i did is got a hold of cory cory same guy that's got cash I told him, I said, I got this dog over here. I need to get him out of here for a while. I'll let you, you buy him off me for 100 bucks. Here, the papers, he's running good. He's trading coons. I've knocked a bunch of coons out to him this season. And uh, you give me 100 bucks, and I'll give you the papers, and you just hang on to him for a month or two while I'll figure out my living situation, and I'll come get him. Well, I sold him over there to Corey for 100 bucks. I mean, it wasn't two or three days later. Corey sold that dog for 1500 bucks. Uh, to somebody and that, that's the last I ever seen of that dog and you know I was real bent out of shape for that for a very long time and over the years you know Corey told me different stories told me he sold him told me he sold him to this one he told me he got hit by a car he told me that you know he got real people mean and he had to put him down I, I mean I heard every story under the sun for about 10 years about that dog and but ultimately my life was so shaken up at that point in time i didn't have my own place to live i was living with people i i ended up moving back to wyoming after all that happened and uh you know just one of them dang things that you know cause you a pain uh cause you grief there aren't really nothing i could do about it i didn't couldn't go back and get him back anyway and um what ended up happening is they, I guess they had felt bad about me getting rid of that dog because of them doing that. So I went ahead and 
bought me another dog. I mean, that was probably a year or two after that. I wasn't, or I was probably about a year later. Uh, I wasn't getting Hazard back. He was gone, gone. So I went and I bought me a little plop puppy, Chopper. Uh, great dog. Great little puppy. Again, I had him at somebody's house that I was living with. And uh, I'd take him over to my buddy's house. And he had that blue tick puppy. And you got the videos of that dog on the channel. Had him. And I skipped everything that you can possibly think of with that dog. and went straight to the cage. And he took right to it. No drags. No scent imprinting. No nothing. Straight to the cage at three months old. He took to it good. Ran drags for him. We With that whole bout. Well, lo and behold, it wasn't but a month you know, after that, they started in griping about the dog barking out there again. So I was like, you know what? I've had it up to here with this. Went to my buddy, and I told him, I said, you know, just take this dog. You can have him. I can't have him where I'm at. They're causing problems with me. So, you know, just take the dog. I don't want to hear or see nothing about it again. Just take him. Um, ultimately, I think I I sold out that day. I sold out, I traded, uh, no, that's right, I didn't just give the dog away, I sold out, I traded, uh, he, my buddy gave me uh, two 15s and an amp and the whole setup to put a, a big, huge sound system in my car, and I thought, well, if they're aggravated about my dog barking, they're going to be aggravated about my speakers bumping, so I traded him that dog for that speaker system, and uh i even traded i traded in my dog my gps and my gun for that speaker system which it was a top line it was a really expensive speaker system and you know we keep on this kind of road with these podcasts and we'll get into them speakers later on but um anyways so I'm out of a dog, I'm out of a gps i'm out of a gun and about that time i'm fed absolutely up to my eyebrows of these people and i'm not living with them no more they don't cost me two dogs one of them which i was you know totally totally one of the my favorite dogs that i ever owned uh especially one of my hunting dogs and it cost me that dog and i i was just you know real mad about it and i ended up just leaving that girl and moving not to wyoming with my current old lady and uh you know, it took me a long time to get to a place to where I could get me a dog again, and Cashman was the dog that I ended up getting. Um, so, with all this being said, I hope you guys appreciate the content that I put out on my channel. Um, I have been through a lot of hardships training dogs. I've been through, you know, scraping teeth try to keep a hold of my dogs uh, moving around life not being you know fair to me and not allowing me to live in one place for too long and being moved around a lot especially in my teenage years when I didn't have a whole lot of say where I was living at and got up here as a grown adult trained and I just said I'm gonna prove a point I'm gonna prove it to every single person that got in my way, that messed me up along the way, and I'm going to prove it, and I'm going to do it with a blue dog, because that's what I started with, and I just felt like everybody that had a hand in doing me wrong over that dog kind of just was snickering at me behind my back, and I said, I'll prove it to them. You think you're smarter than me, you think you're better than me, you think you can train better than me, ultimately, you jacked my dog up, and I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to get my dog, and I'm going to keep him away from you. you ain't gonna, I ain't going to listen to a word you tell me about him, and I'm going to train him, and flat out, that's exactly what I did. And it birthed the channel, and it birthed me, you know, sharing my experiences and sharing my time with you guys. And I'll just tell you one thing. That ain't even all the dogs that I had along this time. I had other dogs. It ain't even all the dogs I've been in the woods with countless countless numbers of buddies and countless numbers of dogs and you know just trying to get a grip on life and getting a grip on reality and i was really clinging to the coon hunting stuff and that's what i did i don't get you know that's what i wanted to do and that's you know even to this day that'd be something really cool and something that i may end up doing 
one way, shape, form, or the other. But uh, I just figured I'd let y'all know about my little nostalgic moment I had today going down there to check on that, uh, get them dogs dropped off, and um, really put a lot of things in line for me. Really did. You know, I did what I set out to do, and I thought, you know, and I hearing what Corey did to me there what about that hazard dog. I thought I'd just show him what a dog meant to me. You know, it wasn't about the dog. It was more about him. And I just figured I'll get me a good dog. And I'm going to get it rolling real good. And I'm just going to take it right over there, Corey. I'm going to give it to him for Scott Free. Just to prove to him whatever I needed to prove. And uh, that's what I did. I ain't got no nothing ill against Corey. I never did really because I he wasn't but a young younger kid either, and yeah, I couldn't expect much out of that. And, you know, just doing what I could to keep something put together. And like I said, ultimately, I never for a long time. I mean, was able to get myself into a position where I could have a dog again. But you know, now I'm grown, adult, and messing around with these squirrel dogs and training helping trying to train around on coon dogs and making these youtube videos and stuff i hope you guys really appreciate it because i really really do greatly appreciate each and every one of you guys that come in here and listen to the content and come in here and you know share support and come in here and just really can see that i'm not out here to try to slip something over on you guys i'm not over here to be dishonest i'm not on this youtube to try to do anything other than just help people not have such a dang hard time because i'm telling you one thing as hard as time as i had somebody would have quit hunting a long time ago and i fought tooth and nail for years and years and years to hunt my dogs and keep my dogs in the woods running out of places to live. i'm telling you one thing when you cling on to something coon hunting would definitely be something that you want to cling on to but i appreciate you guys for stopping in this is going to wrap up the episode nine of talking dogs podcast and don't forget you guys there's that little thanks down there on the videos if you guys want to get down there and you know donate a little something or give me a thanks uh, for making these content and i greatly greatly appreciate it i greatly appreciate you guys outside of that and you guys are just awesome and you know thank you thank you guys so much for finding the channel and hanging out on the channel and listening and heeding words of good advice i believe that i don't want to steer nobody in the wrong direction and i try to be as honest as i possibly can and give my honest opinions and just give you guys the raw unfiltered truth about my truth training dogs uh thank you guys keep them treated